Good morning and welcome to today's event on nav well, workshop, I should say, on navigating employment support to access new talent. I'm Emily Stubbs, Policy and Projects Manager at Greater Birmingham Chambers of Commerce. And today's event is all about what various themes and qualifications are, how some of them have changed recently, and if you can navigate how if you can navigate this landscape, you might find the new talent you need to grow your business and funding to help them help bring them on board. Specifically today, we'll be focusing on apprenticeships, T-levels as opposed to A-levels and how they compare, sector-based work academy placements. And if you have any questions on kickstart and traineeships, um, we unfortunately don't have the time to cover them in too much detail this morning. Um, but Susie branch Haddo from BMET, who is currently waving, um, she'll be putting her details in the chat so that if you have any questions, just let her know. She's happy to take them offline. Um, and that's what we'll be focusing on this morning. Um, this event is part of the Chamber's Grow Through People campaign. Grow Through People aims to help local firms boost productivity and grow through improved leadership and people management skills. This year it involves eight free events with or workshops, I should say, along with thought leadership, blog and video content on the Growth People on the Grace Birmingham Chambers of Commerce website throughout March. The campaign will end with a virtual conference on the 30th of March, which will feature a mixture of inspirational keynotes, thought-provoking panel discussions and practical breakout workshops. I'd like to thank all of our headline sponsors for their support, BMET College, the University of Birmingham's Work Inclusivity Research Centre and the University uh, and Aston University. I'd also like to thank all of our speakers today from BMET for giving up their time to deliver this session. Susie Branch Haddo, Trina Tiernan, Violet Williams, Paul McCullough, Jeremy Clay and Luke Millard. Thank you ever so much for joining us. Before I hand over to Trina and Violet to talk us through the differences between T-levels and A-levels, we have two anonymous polls that I, my colleague Jess will be putting on the screen now that I'd like to ask you to fill out, which might spark some ideas for today's discussions and crucially feed into our research into leadership and people management across the region. I'll mention it now and at the end of today's session, if you can complete the post-event survey that we'll be sending you, it will be hugely appreciated. It's not just about event feedback, but also it will feed into our research into leadership and people management in the region and our stakeholder and our conversations with stakeholders on this agenda. And of course, it will help us shape what growth of people looks like in future years. And don't forget to join us on social media using the hashtag GTP21. Hope you enjoyed the session and take away some ideas to implement in your own business. Please do get involved and post your questions for our speakers in the Q&A box, um, which is uh, next to the chat in the sort of bar of options that you have on your screen. And without further ado, I will now hand over to Trina Tiernan and Violet Williams to talk us through the differences between T-levels and A-levels. Good morning, next slide. Good morning, I'm Violet Williams. And um, the difference between T-levels and A-levels. T-levels are a brand new qualification. They are an advanced level three and equivalent to three A-levels. T-levels also offer students a mix of classroom learning and on the job experience over a longer period of industry placement aimed at students who have a very clear career path. A-levels are over two years, all college-based, with only 30 hours work experience. T-levels, the same two years, but they have 20% industry placement and 80% spent in the classroom. BMET are in their third year of the CDF, which is the Capacity Development Fund, which is the introduction to T-levels, working with employers and businesses to educate them about the new qualification and how they can get involved. Next slide, please. Hi, good morning. I'm Trina from BMET. Um, so what are the different, what are CDF industry placements and T-levels? Well, an industry placement will be specific to the student's course and their career destination. So this could be a business student interested in marketing. Myself and Violet will work with a student to match their career goals to the industry placement. The placements are four to five days or 315 hours across the two year course. Now, 
this is a long generation. I don't know if you remember your one week work experience. For me, I didn't get any experience in my chosen career. So with this four to five days, this gives the student a valuable, meaningful placement. The placements will be included in the student's timetable. So that's one or two days a week and the hours will be flexible to suit your company's needs. And the placements are compulsory for the student and they will be um, go through college's procedures for when they go to placement with you. Next slide, please. So the importance or sort of the benefits um, for placements for students. So industry placements give the student an opportunity to develop their practical and technical skills in the role directly related to their vocational course, as Trina has mentioned before. It enhances opportunities on their CVs and their profiles for university if they want to apply for an apprenticeship or go on to a full employment on the completion of the course. Students can put into practice what they have learned in the classroom, focusing on supporting. We also support the students to develop their attributes, making them more work ready. Next slide, please. Okay, so the benefits of a T-level industry placement to your business. So the students are studying a course which is relevant to an industry placement, as we've said. They will have skills and knowledge that can add value to your team. For example, we encourage you to give the students specific tasks and projects, and this can also be a great helping hands at busy times. Your team also it will enhance your team skills. Your team members might be looking to develop their skills. So supporting an industry placement student will help them towards their CPD. So this will be taken on supervisory responsibilities. And hopefully you might look at taking the student on as an apprenticeship or as a team member at the end of their four to five days, you get to see the work that they've done and the commitment and hard work that they, and the value they bring to your business. Next slide, please. The Employer Support Fund, that was a, this was a pilot scheme that was introduced two years ago. Um, it is to help employers reduce the barriers in taking on an industry placement in the workplace. So the fund can be used for a lack of equipment. So if the student needs a laptop or software, they can use the fund for that, or internal training for mentoring, first health and safety, and for admin costs such as um, public liability, um, set up costs as well. And it's up to 200, sorry, 750 pounds per student. And at BMET, we have been successful in supporting small, medium enterprise businesses with the fund. And they've been able to take on many students, our creative students with art and design sector. Next, next slide, please. So <clears throat> this is my favorite slide the employer, student and tutor feedback. Um, here is an example of a CDF industry placement. Our student, Lily, a fashion student, had an industry placement with Maurice, a fashion designer in Birmingham. So while on placement, Lily designed and made the suit that you see on this slide. And this was shown at London Fashion Week. It's a great achievement for Lily. It was fantastic. Maurice has given Lily a real valuable, meaningful placement. And it also give Lily industry experience and her confidence grew. And this has helped Lily get a place at the London College of Fashion, which she's thrilled and still keeps in contact with us to tell us how she's doing. So Marie sees the value of industry placements for his business and is now looking to take six new students on this coming term. So we're very grateful for Lily for doing a great job and for Marie for working with us. Um, at the bottom, we've got a, a, a um, quote from our um, director of art and design, because at BMET, we work as a team, we work across curriculum, across business development to find the right student and the right company for the student's industry placement. Thank you. 
Thank you so much both. Before we move on to friendships, uh, I have a few questions um, that were prepared just about the differences between T levels and A levels. So obviously, as evident by the fact that we're doing this over webinar, we can't do a lot in person at the moment. Um, can the placements, the 45 day placements that you mentioned for T levels, can they be run virtually? Do they need to be in person? We, they are, we do encourage them to be in person, but obviously the time that we're in at the moment, and we will encourage virtual working from home because we are all working from home. So it still is a meaningful placement. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do, so the 45 day placements, do they have to be 45 sort of consecutive working days or can it be spread over the year, sort of in a, an apprenticeship sort of style, you know, off the job training style, a couple of days a week? Is that, how does it work exactly? At the moment with the CDF project that we're the introduction to T-levels, it is around their studies because it's additional. But T-levels, however, you can have them day release um, in blocks of two, in blocks of um, two weeks or three weeks. So that is more flexible. That will be to do with their actual learning um, in the classroom and um, the employer. The employer might want a project which is over three week project. So they would do their hours in a block. So there's more flexibility um, with the T levels because it is structured around um, the, the outcome. But with CDF, because it's an additional at the moment, um, it's usually on the days when they're not in college. So maybe one day or two days a week. Brilliant, that's perfect. My, my next question was gonna be, can it be sort of flexed around different projects and things that they might be working on? I suppose building on that, what what sort of projects can can the placement students or placement learners, I suppose, possibly the best word? What sort of projects do they work on? So we we've, we have we've had a couple of uh, well, we work with a lot of different companies. We work with Legal and General at the moment. Um, Legal and General, um, they have got a marketing campaign for our graphic design students to encourage young people to take up insurance you know, when they go to university. Um, so they're doing a campaign for them at the moment. Um, we're working with Aston Villa Football Club um, and they're doing um, promotional videos um, for um, knife crime, mental health for the young people of Aston. I'm trying to think of some more, Violet. Now yeah, I was going to say, more <laughs> recently, we've just started a partnership with um, St Basil's um, looking into um, a discreet way of letting people know or when they feel in, in, in harm of get, you know, going into, they think they're going to be homeless. Um, sort of, um, so the, the students are designing um, something discreet that pe that with useful numbers that they can, people can approach without um, you know, people knowing what, what's going on. And we're working with Lenlease at the moment. The students are designing the hoarding boards around the Perry Bar, which was going to be the athletes village. Um, now it's going to be the housing development. All the boards around there, they're going to be working on a project um, on plastic, um, reused plastic. Wow, things. really, really engaging projects. And I like that it sounds like in a lot of instances, it's really tapping into that unique potential of, you know, young people understand you know, what other young people are thinking and using that diversity of perspectives within the business, particularly with um, the university example of university insurance. And then when I was at university, I was not thinking about having <laughs> insurance, <laughs> but I probably should have. So yeah, it wasn't on the top of, wasn't on the top of my list, Emily, I, but I agree. And I think what you can see here is that when a, what I find fascinating about the T-level approach is, is the, the, when you work as a firm, if you work really closely with any further education college who's, who's offering T levels, um, you will. It, it, it's the live brief, and it's the it's the, the the bringing a business challenge, a real business challenge, to a student or a group of students, 
and allowing those students with the support of their, their teaching staff um, to tackle that problem for you. Um, and you can, you can see from the conversation we've just been having, by using that, that, that young brain, by allowing students to have that opportunity to look at a problem through a different lens, what we're hearing back from employers is, it, it sounds obvious, but they're getting a different solution to what they perhaps might get in, in, internally. Um, and then of course, with the beauty of something like a, a, a T-level um, approach is what really excites me about them and you can sort of see from today's, um, I suppose today's webinar journey that we're going on, is it allows firms to work really, really closely with students and then to look at how you can, for want of a better word, talent spot and, and talent match. You know, you're, you're working with students in their early stages of the, their career whilst they're, they're in education. Um, but by a T-level approach, you're engaging with them. So they're starting to become part of your firm and part of your business. Um, and then once they finish their full time education, you're able to perhaps look at where there might be an opportunity for those young people to progress on your own early talent programs or in your own business. So there's a, a really, really strong way of being able to engage in our regional talents and start to sort of, um, I suppose, talent spot individuals and young people into into firms. So I think that's really, really exciting about a T level model and and that sort of different lens, that different way of looking at, at, at problems. Yeah, and Suze, I think that's, um, you raise a good point because I know with me and Jez and talking to some of the employers, and I think uh, Trina mentioned it as well about the, the duration, you know, because normally in the past, if you're talking about trying to get students uh, uh, to do work experience or something, you know, it was never really that long. They didn't feel like they had adequate time to be able to really grow and learn about the industry that they're in or that employer that they're specifically interested in. So, you know, doing this one, I think Trina, was it like something like 45 days or something like that or something 300 odd yes. hours? You know, that's substantial. So that somebody saying, I'll get them in for a couple of days or something like that. So really it gives them a, a, a longer period of time to be able to really get an understanding of the current and working environment and what that means in terms of commitment, passion, dedication, all those things that we love, you know? So it's uh, really good, a really good alternative as well, which I think is a message we're putting out today. Yeah, definitely. And it sounds like a really exciting opportunity for organizations. Getting into the sort of, I suppose, the more administrative side of it. I mean, do, is there like a recruitment process for businesses taking on train uh, T level placements? How does how does that work? Well, over the the time that we've been doing the project, we've done several um, employer engagement um, events. Um, we did a live one where we had um, um, New Star Radio involved. Um, they hosted and we invited employers in and students in. And um, that was really successful. Um, and most recently we've done virtual ones like this, invited employers in, told them about the projects that we're doing, about the students and they've signed up. Um, and then we've taken it forward, got them to meet with the tutors and um, interview the, the students and then got the projects or got the industry placement live and started. Yeah, Emily, so sort of building on that, the, the placements work so that the, um, you know, the, the clients, that's what the employers are, their, their clients of BMAX, um, are, are able to recruit um, the, the, the students onto, onto, into their business, uh, recruit as in not as a paid member of staff, but through the T-level programme. So there is, the, you know, it, it's not just a case of us as a, as a, as a college, for example, sort of placing people that we think bet there is best. There is a, a recruitment process that, that underpins everything. Again, mirroring what yeah, like you would expect in yeah. a in a um, real world uh, job type of, of placements. Um, and, sorry, Trina, go on. Sorry, I was just gonna say our background is my is recruitment. Mine is corporate recruitment um, and Violet is, is, is recruitment. So we look at it as a job description as a, a job and we will go and speak to the students speak to the tutor and we will we will do a short list of uh, candidates students um, we will speak with the tutor who knows the student best who knows their attendance 
you know, um, if their attendance isn't great, they're not dismissed, but we will say, look, you need to get your attendance up so we can start looking at you for this placement because it is a long placement, 45 days. We don't want to be placing students into a company and they leave within a week. Yes, we work with people all the time, but we look at it as a recruitment process um, and it is matched. The student knows the, the job role. We do full job descriptions. We find out, you know, um, the company, what, what you're looking for um, and what you want to get out of it. And we, and we measure the companies as well. We look at the companies and make sure that they're someone that we want to work with for our students. Um, and we've been very lucky because of our, our matching with the companies and the students that we've had really good success. You know, um, you know it's our third year now, even in lockdown and the employers that we work with want to give something back um, and the students want to learn. It is a learning process. And we set the expectations of the student and the employer. So it seems to be going <laughs> well. <laughs> They have, they have individual contracts as well. The students, yeah. you know, when they when they start with an employer, they have individual contracts part of the admin process. Um, so it, it lays out lays out their hours, what's expected. A lot of the time, um, they they don't have to work through the school holidays or the you know, but a lot of the time, um, students actually once they're employed with them, they will work. Um, through the holidays to get those projects that they're working with with that employer and stay on and do those extra hours. Fantastic. That's amazing to hear that they're so sort of engaged in what they're doing and excited about it. Um, just to, I suppose, emphasise something that Susie very quickly touched upon. What costs are involved to an employer? You mentioned funding's available. Do they have to pay wages? How does, how does all of that work? They're not expected at all to, it's not a paid um, industry placement. Um, we have got an instance where an employer offered to pay for lunch. That was, the, that was just an agreement between the two industry placements they took on and that was something that they offered. Um, as far as expenses, um, it's covered through the industry placement for the student for travel, anything additional. So that would come out of like a bursary that we have for the students. But no, employers don't have to pay for it at all. If they want to offer something, that's between, between the student or the industry placement and themselves. But, but there is, the, there is access course. which our team can, can help through, through the um, employer support fund. So if um, we're all about, um, particularly at BMET, um, we're, we're all about removing barriers and trying to make um, the art of the impossible always possible. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the idea behind the Employer Support Fund is that if, um, and, and other colleges will, will have this in place as well, but if, if firms, um, you know, if, if you're running a very small business and you would, this would really interest you, but perhaps you need to invest in, in some sort of kit to be, able to, to, to be able to take somebody on, then we can look at that through the Employer Support Fund and see whether we can, in essence, that fund will, will, will fund to, to buy the kit if that's needed. There are, of course, it's, it, it's government funding. So there's, there's sort of different elements that we can and can't fund, but Trina and, and Violet um, are, have sort of read the rule book um, thousands of times and are sort of gurus in, in that area. So they can guide firms through what you can and can't um, um, look to, to, to fund. And also, could I add, and I think I'm going to go to Trina and Violet to just confirm that I've got this right, but um, <laughs> talking about the, uh, the support fund, I'm sure uh, employers, if they've got no previous experience on uh, mentoring and stuff like that, does, can they access some money to, uh, for training? Definitely. That? That's, one yeah, of the, okay. that, that's one of the, I would say, out of all the um, employers that we've funded, that's one thing that comes through. Um, the money can be used for mentorship. So the person that um, we recommend, they sort of have a body person that they, they work with, that person could be um, use the money for mentoring training and also health and safety training, any training that will enable that industry placement to be successful. 
Yeah, because I think the fear from an employer, probably if they're listening in today and haven't done this before, is, you know, have I got the systems in place or, you know, am I equipped to support a student and what are the requirements? So I think that's a, that's a nice touch for them to be able to know that there's, there's funding and support available to set them up to be able to make sure that they, they help and support those students as well. So, yeah, yeah, definitely a positive, that one. A useful fact as well is that the money can be split so you can have some up cost, some up front for the setup costs right, okay. and that right at the end when they finish or they can have it all up front it very much depends on what they actually need at that time fantastic that's actually really really interesting it's something that i didn't know um about t levels and the sort of or the administrative sort of support around them um, to lead us into our next segment on, well, I won't ruin the surprise, um, but to lead us into our next segment, I just have one final question. There's one in the chat, um, which actually I'm going to save until we get a bit further through the sessions. I think it'd be a very good question to wrap up with. Um, but what subjects are T-levels currently happening in? And then I suppose what, what happens after a T-level? What, what are the sort of pathways for someone doing a T-level? T-levels um, sort of started um, this year and will continue, uh, other colleges will start um, September 21, um, sort of digital, um, education and childcare, um, healthcare, um, media design. Um, those are sort of ones that are being rolled out at the moment. Those, so sectors, we're at, those sectors they're at their launch period um so they're being they're being rolled out a, um, across education so what i could do emily is just um when we share the follow-up information we can just share a sort of a, a one page so people can see a sort of at what point their industry is, is is planning on on being rolled out by by government um and also um we can signpost people um to to colleagues in, in, in other colleges as well who are working on, on different T levels or at, or at a different stage of this to, to ourselves. You know, for, for us as um, passionate drivers of vocational education, yes, of course, we will always encourage you to, to talk and engage with BMAP, but when we're not able to support, we'd always encourage, would, would always like to be able to signpost you to other colleges in, in further education who can, because for us, it, it is about that. Um, yeah, that really that vocational um, element that that we're also passionate about, and we feel actually changes people's lives. Um, so we can we can send all of that as part of a follow up to to, to today as well. Fantastic. And then, um, sort of post post T level, what happens? So someone completes a T level. Is it like a university? Is it like an A level where you you know go off to university afterwards? Um, is there a, a sort of suggested route? It depends on the student, you know, it's all individual, you know, um, myself and Violet will, you know, when they, when they start college, we will look at the course that they're doing, the T level, you know, the placement that we, we place them on, what do you want to do after, sometimes they want to go on and do an apprenticeship, sometimes they want to go to university, and some want to go straight into the world of work, so it depends on the student, and once they finish their, their placement, we do help them, you know, with, with their UCAS application, their placement goes toward points towards their UCAS application. As I said, with Lily, she wasn't too sure what she wanted to do. And she's moved to London from Birmingham. Um, and we have a lot of students that once they do the placement, it, they, their, their mind changes throughout. Um, this is something I really want to do. Sometimes the student thinks, actually law isn't for me but I like this part of the experience I'm going to look to do another course at university but it's giving them the right experience I suppose and a bit of knowledge because they don't know what's out there until they start the placements and we've got some students at the moment that are fashion students who don't want to go to university um, and are looking for an apprenticeship so we're working now we know Maurice we know people that he works with. Um, we're looking for apprenticeships for, for these students. 
So um, it depends really on the, on the student. When, when, when you think about the, the theme of this event is about navigation, and I think that navigation could be employee-led or it could be learner-led. You know, so mm. I think you know, what, what we would do is we'd use all our like, toolkit of what we've got available for, for both sides. And like Susie says there, in some cases, it may be something that we don't offer, but other, other training providers may well do. So it, it's about finding the right, the right person for the right route or the right course every time, really. So mm -hmm. that's, that's our aim. That's our, our role as in, in part of the BD team. Absolutely. Very, uh, a very personalised approach for each, each individual and each business. So that leads nicely on into um, our next segment, which is on apprenticeships. So I'm going to share my slides again. Um, and hand over to uh, Paul McCalla and Jeremy Clay, who will be talking about apprenticeships. Right, so yeah, that leads us really nicely on to apprenticeships. And good morning, everybody, from a, a very bright but blustery Staffordshire over here. Um, so uh, I hope, hope the, the weather doesn't affect too many people's uh, internet, although we've had a bit of a, a chat about that this morning before you came on board. So... Um, well, no, welcome to, welcome to this segment. Um, this is very much a whistle-stop tour, really, about apprenticeships. And I think there's, there's been a, uh, an event previously that uh, my colleague Paul, uh, which I'll introduce to you in, in a second, um, was involved in called Demystifying Apprenticeships, which I, I presume, Emily, you give me a nod if that link is still around so people can jump onto that, um, which uh, gives people a bit more information about uh, the, the myths around apprenticeships and, and what they can do. But, uh, so this is a little bit about that today. Um, so there was a deeper dive, but this is just basically about what is an apprenticeship. So we're going to talk about the fundamentals around that. Um, obviously, we're talking to uh, employers in this case, so the benefits to yourselves, uh, part of the businesses. Some of the things that have come out recently, the spotlight there on some of the help available. Obviously, there's been some new incentives during this uh, COVID period that we've been in. And, um, and also um, the view of an employer. So we, we do also have um, Paul is going to give a, a bit of a case study about one of his employers that he's, he's spoken to and the help that, and support that he has, he has given. So um, on to the next slide then, please, uh, if, if that's okay. So what, what is an apprenticeship? And, and I mean, it's great to hear about the, the incentives that are going on, the initiatives that are going on in fear of education. And if you're as, as, as sort of as long in the tooth as me, this is my 20th year now in uh, fear of education. You do see some of these initiatives that have perhaps been tried and tested before and, and the good ones come back around. And um, in T levels, you've just heard, you know, uh, Violet and Trina there talk about T levels. And, and it's very similar to a program or program led apprenticeships, which were around a few years ago, uh, which is based on that, uh, that skills, uh, uh, training and knowledge but also some work experience as well so you know it, it's, it's interesting to see how t levels are coming back now and um and how how employers and how uh, training providers can can use these um and then we, obviously what we're looking at in some respect is what we call employer-led apprenticeships which is which is what we're, we're about now and, and apprenticeships have been around for an awful long time uh, even i did one once um many many years ago in, in engineering for a company called gec um but Actually, they go back a little bit further than that. They go back to the Middle Ages. And in some respects, apprenticeships, the premise of an apprenticeship is exactly the same. It's, it's about taking someone from one level up to another level, from an apprentice up to what used to be called a master craftsman. So apprenticeships are, are very much in vogue. Obviously, the government is pushing for it. And the style of apprenticeship is, is very different, perhaps, to what it was traditionally. Uh, in, in, in one of those key areas is the fact that you know, they're open to many more people now than they were many moons ago. So we're not just talking about young people coming in to, uh, to do apprenticeships. We're talking about any age, to be quite honest. So they do range not just from 16 to 18 year olds, but also anyone who is in work who wants to learn a new skill, which is relevant to their standard of education, but also the job role in mind. So. It's about new skills, you know, and in essence, an apprenticeship uh, in this terms, in this sort of terminology, it's a funded program. Uh, and hopefully we'll just we'll touch on some of that funding and some of the incentives that are there for, for, an, for an employer. We talk about the levels, we talk about the range of apprenticeships available uh, and apprenticeships are available in many, many different sectors and many different sort of subject areas and range from 
uh, a level two or sort of a GCSE or O level in, in old money uh, standard right through to a degree level qualification. So apprenticeships can, you can progress, you can progress up to a degree level qualification. It may take you a bit longer as a, as a, as a, a learner, um, but they are there. And, and looking at it from an employer's perspective, you know, you, you can look at apprenticeships which are available across a range of uh, skills, job roles, experience levels within your organization. So there's pretty sure there's something which does fit. And again, that comes back to our role as BMET uh, uh, to, to find that right route for you and for your for your other young people coming in or your existing staff. In terms of duration, um, obviously a level two probably won't take as long as a, as a level a level six or a, a level five, level four uh, apprenticeship. Uh, and we put there from 12 months to four years, which is pretty much what, what they do. Um, 12 months, uh, we're basing it there on the practical period. And what you tend to find is um, sort of a minimum level, really, including what we call now the, the endpoint assessment, which is a bit of a bolt on to uh, apprenticeship uh, programs, where that would be like the last two or three months where we've, we're helping to get through that, a project based assessment or a, a test. Or, or even just a, uh, a, a professional discussion. So we would look at that, we would come in and discuss that with you about what is right for, for your individual or your, your, your business. Employees have a range uh, and access to a range of incentives. Um, and with further education, the only constant is change. So obviously we find that these things do change on, a, on an annual basis. And we've just had the, the budget there that's come out. So, there's been some new incentives and I'll touch base on some of that uh, in, in a couple of slides. Um, after my colleague, Paul McCullough, uh, the other face of uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, Twitter, the Twitter program that we had, um, Twitter campaign, so we're gonna put Paul on. He's gonna talk a little bit more about the benefits uh, to employers and the sort of things that have cropped up in the last few years with friendships. Over to you, Paul. Well, thank you, Mr. Jeremy Clay. <laughs> <laughs> And um, yeah, I think Jess summed it up perfectly. I mean, the, I think the reality is, especially if we're, we're talking about the, the benefits to a business and just touched upon it earlier, uh, we've seen this, we've seen the apprenticeships change. We know they're gonna continue to change. It's an ever growing program. Um, the range and the types of apprenticeships that are offered are quite diverse as well. Uh, and also, I mean, things like Jess mentioned around the, the age group, you know, Primarily, I think the, the response we get from a lot of people, especially employers, is they, they thought apprenticeships were probably um, just for uh, young people, which is a, is a myth, uh, something we were asked in our last event. And actually, it, the age range is pretty much 16 and upwards. Um, you know, it's a brilliant thing, I think, from us. You know, we love, we love satisfaction of what we do in helping people change their lives. And I think the, the beauty of it is, is to see people that are school leavers, um, people that are um, just coming out of uh, college and looking to do something else, those that are unemployed that are coming to us. And equally, a lot of um, people that have families and maybe a change in their lifestyle or the kids have left home and they want to do something different and pick up a new skill. It's so diverse right now. For me, it's fantastic. I love it, you know, to be able to put people into different opportunities and BMET really try to embrace that. And you know, really kind of sit down and do some sort of advice and guidance up front, and, and provide them with that information. So, for from a business's point of view, um, you know, it's interesting to see the range of candidates potentially you can have, and move away from that misconception that it's just about people that are young. It's about anybody that wants an opportunity, really, to to grow, to earn money, and to get a qualification. And I think based on that, if if you're looking at the slides that we're presenting today. Um, this one in particular is just giving us some stats and numbers around uh, what employers say in their feedback. Um, this is generally something that we've seen, but also something that's commonly available on the apprenticeship.gov website. Uh, UCAS, you can find it on their, on their website. So these are national statistics. Um, the great thing is, you know, let's be honest, if you're an employee and you're taking on an apprentice, it's going to help you in several areas. Um, for us, a common thing we find is, is about growing talent. And I think all of us will say that, or have said it at some point in time <laughs> in our job role, that it's about growing talent. And it literally is, you know, it's, it, 
you're getting somebody that really you've got the opportunity to to train them from day one. Um, if they have got prior skills, sometimes transferable skills are a great bonus um, to people in that role, depending on their age uh, age group. Uh, and literally, with the support of a college, not just us, other colleges and providers, you know, we ideally give you that underpinning knowledge that really enhances what they're doing in the workplace. So it definitely does help improve and develop uh, a motivated and skilled workforce. Uh, and, you know, you get a chance with apprentices to help them develop skills that are relevant. And we'll spend some time talking about very briefly in terms of how you can develop their skills relevant to the apprenticeship. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's other elements because, and Jez will agree with this, you know, what we like to do is talk to your employers from the beginning, help them to get on that initial journey, um, go through the recruitment process, help them find the right candidates, start them on that journey, curriculum, then, you know, engage with them to deliver that apprenticeship, continue to account manage and support them uh, and help them throughout the program, you know? And, and a lot of the times we hear about how they've improved productivity. You know, you, you have somebody that's coming in potentially that's motivated and they're coming on time and they just want to learn and you're feeding them all this information and you, you're able to see how they, they translate that into their day-to-day -day job, their activities. Um, and, it, and employers are really excited by that. And like Jess said earlier about the incentives and everything else you have to be able to help you, especially as a small business, uh, take that chance. You know, and ultimately that's what it is. Let's, let's be honest, we're in lockdown. Uh, well, we're phasing away from that. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's been a tough year for most. And there are concerns we've heard from employers about wanting to take on apprentice. You know, they're not even sure if it's something that they want to do. Um, and actually, when you sit down with us and we go through the various incentives and, and then the benefits that we'll discuss today, we, we always um, really are keen and excited to work with employers to take on apprentices. Uh, and also, you know, it doesn't matter if you're engineering, if you're IT, if you're business and professional services, if you're horticulture, whatever, it's also about improving the quality uh, of the service that's available, for you, you know, what you have as an employer. Apprentices will help you do that. Of course, it, you know, there's a lot of other things behind the scenes, you know, it's how you communicate to that apprentice. It's the relationship you have with your college, with the college or the provider. It's how the three of us link together to be able to support that person. So don't get me wrong, I'm not saying it's just take on an apprentice and bang, you know, it's gonna happen for you. It's a lot of work to make all those components really move together in unison. And I think once you've got that relationship with your college, your provider, um, that really makes the process a lot easier. Uh, and if we can move on to the next slide real quick. Uh, and talking about that, yeah, I wanted to touch on the, the thing around um, you can adapt the training, which we mentioned slightly. I think we just touched upon it earlier. Um, yeah, quality, the, the apprenticeships from day one, and you know, you heard Jess say medieval times. I like that one, Jess. Nice. <laughs> and, uh, and people forget about how long apprenticeships have, have been around. And the reality is, from an employer's point of view, you're able to have some core standardized units that are really attached to every apprenticeship that are a must in terms of delivery. And that could be anything from health and safety, employability, uh, working as part of a team, et cetera, et cetera. And then you get a, a large um, group of optional units that you're able to select. Um, how that's delivered and when it's delivered throughout the program is down to your college or your provider. Equally, we do sit down with you here at BMAT and look at those optional units up front and try to roadmap that journey out prior to you starting. Uh, and you know, any college or provider should be able to talk to you about those optional units. And that's where you get the, the opportunity to mold it according to the needs of your business. Um, you know, and they're learning new skills. So it is one of those things where, once again, you're talking about somebody coming to the business, somebody learning new skills. Somebody being able to put that into, into effect and getting support from an outside source, a college or a training provider. Um, us being able to work with you and adapt that qualification to suit your needs. Um, being able to deliver this at different levels. So if that person is brand, has never done it before and they've never been employed and they just left, left school and they're nervous and their family are really concerned about how they're going to do this, and we put them on a, a lower level qualification to start with, your, your entry level, then 
you know, they have the chance to grow through the business. And equally for the people out there that have experience and have some sort of transferable skills or have experience in that sector, they don't always have to start at a level two. So from an employer's point of view, you could have somebody in an entry level qualification, you could have somebody in an advanced apprenticeship qualification, level threes. You can even, with what we did recently, and uh, I know me and Jess work in engineering a lot, you know, we're putting people straight into some jobs on a level five qualification or a level three or a level six, um, depending on the employer and the candidates thereafter. So the, once again, a misconception that was brought up before, it's not really, I'm going to do an apprenticeship as an employer, that person has to be a level two. Actually, let's look at what you're trying to, what you're trying to achieve and let's see what level qualification relates directly to you and the employer and then let us go away and try to find you those, those candidates. Uh, and that's how you really expand and, and your existing workforce. And on the flip, and Jez, we always talk about this, don't we? on the flip, you know, you take that sort of element and you think, okay, great, I've recruited an apprentice, I've recruited an apprentice, this person's brand new to my business, excellent, let's start that journey. On the flip side, you might have existing people in your workforce that actually may not have that qualification. Uh, and something that I, I, we find quite interesting at the moment, and maybe Susie, you'll agree, it's probably down to lockdown and all things online now. We live in a, a world of Teams and Zoom and everything else. But there are a lot of people, for example, in jobs right now that have a lot of experience, um, know how to support their teams, have a lot of product knowledge or, or service skills, but maybe don't have a management qualification. So something like that, for, for example, where you can talk about the, the professional development and they're already in the business, they're already working for you as an employer. You can also get them onto qualifications or staff that have been there for a long period of time that maybe have all the skills but don't have the qualifications to match. Think about how you empower your existing staff to be able to offer them a qualification that will enhance their skills and recognize and unify everything that they've done on the job. And that's the sort of thing that apprenticeships can bring. So it's a powerful tool if used correctly. I don't know, it sounds like some superhero skills there, but you know, so it's a powerful tool, but the reality is we will help you on that journey to be able to understand how it can work for your business. I think that just to, to interrupt slightly there, Paul, is, um, uh, on that point, um, uh, obviously I couldn't agree, <laughs> couldn't agree more. And I think just to sort of, Give a, our own example of that, um, as you would ex expect, um, as, as as big sort of advocates of apprenticeships to, to lead by example. But when I when I take a second to take a step back and look at our own team, um, uh, about fifty percent of our team um, are on some sort of apprenticeship program. Um, so we have got younger members of our team who joined our team on an entry level apprenticeship program. Um, sort of a level two or level three business administration role. Um, but we have got more mature members of our team um, across a, a spanning age range um, who are on different um, development programs um, for on an apprenticeship program. So we have um, a couple of people and as we're in growth through people and, the, and sort of the growth through people theme around leadership and management, um, we have a couple of people who are on um, operational management um, apprenticeship programs. Um, so that's at sort of level level five and developing their, their management skills at, at that level. We have uh, another person who's on a team leading apprenticeship program. Um, so developing their, their skills in that sort of more of a team leading um, role. Um, and we also have people who are on um, advice and guidance uh, apprenticeship programs. So looking at how they can develop their skills to become qualified um, uh, advice and guidance um, professionals, particularly within the education setting. So um, yes, you'd expect us to do that because obviously we, we are complete advocates of the apprenticeship programme, but as the person who, who leads that team, um, it's a really, really helpful and supportive way of looking at CPD um, across our, our department. Um, so just to give a bit of, a, of, of an internal example there on, on particularly around that leadership and management point. Yeah, thanks, Susan. I think that's a great point. Um, you know, not only are we, you know, as they say, probably talking a talk, we're walking a walk, you know, we're experienced and have knowledge about how we've supported people. And also we can give you a first line account on what it's like to be able to balance your apprenticeship, your life and your job. Um, you know, let's, not, let's be serious. It's, it's not the easiest thing to do, but, you know, we, we've at least learned 
how to make it um, easier to manage. And I think that's the that's the message. I think am I right in saying Susan's trying to put across there because you know it's 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 definitely about empowering people to be able to to do more and, and gain some key skills. But from an employer's point of view, it's, it's what does that journey look like? What's the commitment levels? You know, how does it impact on your existing staff and that sort of thing? So yeah. Great times, you know, and it's only going to get better with some of the improvements that are coming. So we're pretty, we're pretty excited about that as well. And if we can jump on to the next slide, Jess, I know you want to talk about some of the funding incentives. You know, perhaps we can share this one between us if you want. So if I yeah. hand that back over to you, my friend. Boom. No, yeah, absolutely. And, and obviously, just just jumping a little bit about what's just been said. You know, I, I think um, I mentioned earlier the other thing in, in FE which is constant is change and, and we have to change ourselves as a, as a not only as a, as a BD team but also as a, as a provider and some of the things that we, we do provide and some of the programs that we start to deliver are based on the information coming back to us from employers you know so we have to learn and we have to adapt uh, and typical examples of that are some new programs that we, we've now put out, out there, which one is uh, improvement techniques, which is, you know, based on looking at uh, a business, looking at an employer and, and how they can make changes to their, their processes, whether that be manufacturing or whether it be administrative. So, you know, looking at some of those, um, basically wheedling out some of the, the waste elements within a business, you know, uh, using things like Six Sigma, which are key skills there on, on, on looking at in, in change and improvement. And that's something that we've started to develop. We've got a couple of uh, employers that are uh, already involved in that. And a lot of people are interested in that. But also new digital programs as well, Paul, I think that we've got now coming up some digital yep. sort of media type things, which, which again, we've adapted because we've listened to employers, you know, so it's not just about employers adapting, it's about us as a provider also adapting to what's out there and what's required. Uh, and like Paul says, some of that is existing staff who want to grow. Um, so, you know, we, we said apprenticeship is a, it's a funded program. It's a, it's a funded opportunity to employers to jump on board with really. Paul also mentioned earlier on the other slide about adapting specific programs. So looking at the, the optional units, uh, which can be tailored. Uh, I always give the example of um, one of our previous employers where we, we used to deliver catering and, you know, one of the units was, was filleting a fish. Well, if you never touch a fish, there's no point picking that unit. So it's a case of, you know, developing that program around, around your needs as well. So this is, this is, again, going back to that navigation. And one of the things that we do is we sit down with you as an employer. Uh, in some cases, friendships may not be the, the, right, the right solution. But we'll also we'll find other solutions that we can look at and look at the funding streams that are out there and the incentives out there for, for an employer to, to jump on board with, uh, and that's part of our role. So going back to this slide, really, I think Paul might have mentioned that is about you know there are some commitments there from employers. It's not just take take take. Actually, there's an element there of give as well, and and, and we we expect that from uh, employers, and we we explain that straight away. Obviously. You know, in terms of wages, you know, that's something that the college doesn't get involved with. That's something that the agreement is, a, is an employer and its employee um, contract. You know, so there are some some uh, some costs there. There's the commitment there as well. You know, 20 percent of, of the, the working week um, has to be logged as, as sort of part of the training. That could be a day release um, at the college or it could be. It could even be in terms of engineering a full year away from the workplace when actually a full year at the college. So there's there's lots of there's lots of commitments there, and we we make that fairly well, very clear from the outset when we're talking to employers. But obviously there are some funding and incentives available for for employers. And in terms of the cost, um, you know, on the slide there it talks about a five percent contribution. That is. Pretty much the maximum contribution an employee would have to pay in terms of funding the apprenticeship and, and i'll give you an example of that and so for example a customer service uh, qualification um where the, the the funding for that is is three and a half thousand pounds if if you're taking on um an apprentice or you put in one of your existing staff to do that apprenticeship um a 16 to 18 year old is fully funded there's no there's no fee at all there in terms of the contribution but someone who's over 19 does a 5% contribution. And that, that, 
that equates to 175 pounds. So it's not a massive amount. It, it, you know, the other 95% is funded through the government, uh, the ESFA, uh, and that comes into the college. So there's, there's contributions that are available. But think of it from the point of view that at least 95% of the funding comes to, to, to support you as a business for, you, for your apprentice. Um, in terms of uh, a 16 to 18 year old, there are also some incentives there which have been around for a while. The 16 to 18 apprent uh, incentive of a thousand pounds is still there and it's still gonna be there as far as we know. Uh, and that's something which is, I say, it's been around for a while. Um, there are now new incentives that the government has brought in since um, sort of August uh, last year, actually, 2020. It's, it's, it's crazy that we're talking about 2021 now, but so there have been some incentives which are specifically around hiring a new apprentice during this COVID-19 period. Uh, and some news on that from the budget from the, the Chancellor, is it last week, where yeah. that's the incentive is going to be raised to £3,000 up until the 30th of September from, from April the 1st. So there, there are lots of incentives out there. Our aim is to help you to, to identify those. Uh, and Paul, if you want to just jump out in there, we, we obviously from the 1st of April, employers will also need to set up a, a digital account um, to secure their funding for their apprenticeship. Uh, yeah. And we're encouraging people to do it now because obviously they, they can also use this account to attract their incentives. Yeah, and I think that's a, that's a great point, Jez. I mean, once again, we're more than happy for employers to reach out to us directly because that will change depending on the, you know, the needs will, will change depending on the size of the employer. Um, and also, it's, it's worth pointing out, which, you know, the employers we work with in, in terms of background sectors and stuff are quite diverse. The, the size of the employer has an impact as well on um, contributions and everything else without going into that too much. But also, you know, we come in and support a lot of levy paying companies. Um, and these are your really large employers that um, have a digital account set up each month um, that's accumulating funds for them to spend on their apprentices. And once again, you know, it can be quite complex, but we, we've had enough experience to be able to work and help employers navigate their way through that. So, it, you know, it's good to see that the current program for apprenticeships is set up to really support that two, three, four, four person organization up to large employers, levy paying employers that are in the thousands, hundreds of thousands, for example, we work with local businesses, national businesses, um, businesses around the world, basically. Um, so we're really available to able to support you with that. And the good thing is the incentive which, which Jez mentioned, um, the incentive really is there um, to help businesses out. And, you know, I've heard some really great stories over the years, how employers have used that incentive fund to re-energize or motivate their, uh, their apprentices or to put them on additional training or to get them equipment or, you know, whatever. Um, and the good thing is it's there as a bonus. It's not something that we would feel employers will come to us because they think that it's, it's all for the incentive Otherwise, it wouldn't be an incentive, you know, it's there for employers to really think if I'm going to take somebody on and I need to put them through an additional training or, or have it up the, the tools or the resources available. This is something that's very useful. Uh, it's done in the in the first year over two payments split, split equally, normally around the fourth or the twelfth month. But then again, you know, without me going into great detail about it. We're available to support you guys and give you a better understanding of how that works. And I'm sure you agree, Jez, you know, the, the employers that we're working for are quite di uh, diverse in terms of size, you know, from your small to medium enterprise, you know, your really tiny micro enterprise, your medium size to large employers and your, your levy paying employers. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, I think you're right there, Paul. You know, so th there are incentives regardless of size uh, and, and our, our role is, is to help you to navigate through that and, and you know when we sit down with you we, we, we will review the needs that you have whether that be recruitment or so looking at existing staff uh, growth um, and we'll identify those, those solutions um, which which are available to you really so to make it as cost effective to you obviously and to look at some of those uh, those bonuses which uh, we can we can pick up um, 
just from talking to you really and getting to know you uh, and hopefully you know, in terms of the, the employers that we do work with, a lot of the employees come back to us time and time again because of the support that we, we offer. Uh, and an example of one of those uh, employers, uh, if you want to go to the next slide, Emily, is one that Paul's been working with, Bennett. Um, and I think Paul's been working with these over uh, a period now. And just give us a bit of ex explanation, Paul, about you know the support you've given them and, uh, and what they've benefited from. Thanks, Jeremy. Yeah, um, just wanted to touch on the Bennett um, Landscape and Service, Birmingham-based company through and through. And they are a, a sort of small to medium employer. So, you know, 50 plus staff kind of thing. And their journey has been really interesting where, you know, and this is something to, to every employer as well. So potentially, as you can probably see on the slide, you get a feeling of what they're about, you know, landscaping, horticulture, that sort of thing. And their journey really was about initially coming to us to try and find a horticulture apprentice uh, and to be able to, grow that person, no pun intended, horticulture, grow, landscaping, sorry, <laughs> couldn't resist, grow that, so grow that apprentice in the business for them to be able to then become the next team leader or supervisor and actually for them to be able to then train apprentices of the future. And I think what they, what they realize and what a lot of employers do is once they've, they've sort of had success on that apprenticeship journey and they can see the benefits that it offers like we discussed earlier. It then opened them up with discussions with BMAT to exploring other areas of the business. So from literally talking um, about a horticulture apprentice, uh, they then went on to then recruit accountants, um, administrators, and a range of other apprentices um, purely because they recognize the benefits and so much so Matt, who's uh, Matt Bennett, who's the actual owner of the business, it's a family business. Um, when I sat down with him and I wanted to, that's why we've used this quote from him. You know, he literally said that's that's now their that's their vision. You know, for their apprentices to grow in the business, to have apprentices across many areas of the business, and for them to be able to you know to be able to train the next up and coming apprentices. And it's it's funny because when we originally started the journey. It, the uh, you know they believed that an ideal apprentice was somebody who was 16 to 18, 19 to 24, or whatever that sort of age group leaving school, which most employers do. And now, when I look back and I think of the the apprentices that they have, their age group is is vast. You know, they they recruit anybody. Um, they know now the value of really just looking at the candidates for what they are and looking at how they can utilize them in the business. So. Just wanted to share that with you guys in terms of, you know, where you start off is not necessarily where you end. Um, what opportunity you see initially might expand to other opportunities um, that are available to you. And that's something that BMAT will offer to you in terms of having those ongoing discussions to kind of help you grow and navigate through the apprenticeship um, um, area. Fantastic, thank you both. Um, just quickly before we move on to talk about sex based worth channeling placements, you spoke about um, sort of businesses, the business that you've worked with, their, their vision for the future apprenticeships within their business. There's been, as you sort of touched on, the inevitable uh, change and endless change, as it sometimes seems, with a lot of these, these qualifications and schemes. But what's, I suppose, What's your vision for apprenticeships? Do you, you know, do you think apprenticeships are the future or vocational training more broadly? What, what do you hope to see in the future with apprenticeships? Well, if I can, oh, sorry, Suze, I see you. Did I rob the words <laughs> out of your mouth there? You, <laughs> you're about to Feel go. free, Paul, go for it. Oh, okay. first. Um, you know, I, I've been in apprenticeships like Jeremy for a long time. So I'm always proactively going to say, I love apprenticeships and I think they're great. But I think for anybody out there, the reality is it's, it's one of many choices. You know, it, is it the be all and end all? No. But is it definitely a, a, a serious choice for people to make in terms of where they're going in terms of education, employment? Absolutely. So it's not the be all and end all, but it's definitely a, a firm, viable option. And the good thing is, I think nowadays, uh, I've seen people actually now, when you say to them, you can now do a degree on some sectors and apprenticeships and they're like what 
you could do a degree. So even though that's been around for quite a while, you know, the reality is a lot of people still um, aren't aware of how, uh, of how many levels are available and how far they can go. So if university isn't for you, for example, it's nice to know if, you, if you're in the right sector and we know the qualifications are expanding all the time, you can literally go from a level two, level three qualification and an intermediate qualification and navigate through the years and different levels and end up doing a degree and not being in full-time education and still earning money at the same time. So it's what's right for some, probably isn't right for others, but it's a good choice, good option. Sorry, Suze. That's okay. okay. Um, I think, Emily, if you, if, you, if you look at education, if you look at the economy, um, you know, and, and we're in a very changing landscape at the moment, but um, we as a nation do have a skills crisis uh, and, and we do have a skills issue. Um, and if you if you look most recently, um, what, what month were in March? So, so in February, um, the government produced the FE white paper um, and, and running through that, the, the theme of that is skills for jobs. Uh, and running through that is how um, employment employers and further education colleges can work closer together. Uh, and in essence, that the, the programs and, and education and vocational training really has got employers running through it like a, a stick of rock um, and, and, and regional and employer needs. So, so for me, um, as, a, as a, you know, somebody who sort of fell into to FE um, and, and stayed here because of a complete advocate of the vocational training, I think what's coming really clear through both that report to what we're seeing in the regional economy is that we do need a balance in terms of skills and education between both the higher education route and the vocational education route. And I think um, yeah, there's, there's always different needs from a business perspective and from an individual's perspective about what routes are best for, for, for them. But there's also an economic uh, need. Um, and I think what we're beginning to see through the launch of the FE white paper and through, through firms just taking a different look at how they can look at recruitment is that you are seeing vocational training becoming more of, um, I suppose, having more of a spotlight on it and becoming more of that valuable, valuable option for people. Um, and, you know, that's what we see a lot over, um, over the, the channel, over in Europe, um, the sort of the, the credibility of, of vocational training. And of course, that's what apprenticeships are. So, so for me, it's, it's, it's touching on what Jeremy said as well earlier, the more we ourselves as further education colleges, independent training providers, um, and, um, and universities, the more we can work in tandem with businesses to understand what types of programs and needs the business has, and then we can develop product to suit those needs, the more we're gonna see a really good drive through, through apprenticeships. So for me, it's about that relationship to make sure that we've got that, that product development right. Yeah, I, I, I mean, personally, I think, uh, and Susie's touched on it there a little bit, in terms of, I think there's two things really that stand out to me is one is how the levy is used. Uh, and I think employers, uh, the larger levy paying organizations may, may force a change in terms of um, using some of that levy for perhaps non-apprenticeship funding stuff. So perhaps just MVQ only, which is, or the old MVQ only, which is the old train to gain sort of project that happened a few years ago under, under the Labour government. Um, so whether, whether that happened, whether they can use some of that funding for that. Um, and the only other thing, and Susie mentioned there is about skills, and I think skills over qualifications. I think that's probably where we're, we're moving to a little bit now, where you get some of the, the apprenticeship standards aren't specifically qualification led. You know, so there's no, there's, sometimes there's no qualification at the end of it, but there's an apprenticeship at the end of it. And, and, and the example I use would be for things like um, the changes in construction now, where, you know, it, it, it's it's a lot, some of it is now sort of you know concrete formed as opposed to brick work. So you know so some of those skills may be maybe changing, and some of those requirements for a, a construction company may be changing. So it's not specifically you know making an arch out of bricks when you can. The way way it's happening now is uh, preformed concrete or something like that. So it, they will adapt. I think it will adapt to skills only. Not Absolutely, and, and I suppose just meet the needs of employers as sort of the jobs of the future develop. Yeah. Fantastic. 
Well, speaking of meeting the needs of employers, I will now hand over to Susie and Luke, who will talk us through sex-based work academy placements. Just my slides up. Fantastic. Over to you, Susie and Luke. Thanks, Emily. And I'm conscious of time. And I know there was one question in particular you wanted to pick up up at the end. So um, I can guarantee you um, we will finish on time. Um, so I'll just spend the next 10 minutes really giving a, a high level um, highlight of sector based work academy programs or as they are colloquially known as, as swaps. Um, swaps, in my opinion, are one of the um, best kept secrets with, within um, education and commerce. Um, so I'm really pleased to be able to just shine a little bit of a, of a spotlight on them today. Um, I can see one of the attendees, I think we've got Jane Young from DWP with us today as well, who probably would, would hopefully agree um, um, that, um, that swaps really are that, uh, that best kept secret. And the reason why I find that they're the, the best kept secret is um, down to the impact that they can have on your business. So in, in brief, uh, a, a swap is a recruitment program, um, but it's a recruitment program that has uh, three elements um, connected to it. So the first element is uh, training, so you would work with a training provider um, like ourselves to develop the content of that program. The second element is experience of work. Um, so that could be something from um, applicants coming in for an assessment center on your premises. It could be for some working on your, um, working on um, sort of some of your, your induction that you might normally have, you could move into your, your SWAP program. And um, my colleague Luke will, touch on that a little bit shortly when we explain about one of our clients and the model that they've been successfully running with us. Um, and the third element is an interview. Um, so the candidates that come through a, a programme, um, you, you aren't required to take on all of those candidates, but the, a requirement is that you would interview uh, all of those candidates. So when we, when we look at those candidates, the, the typical candidate that comes through a, a, a SWAP programme uh, are 18 plus, um, and who are currently um, unemployed uh, and actively seeking employment. Um, and so what the programme allows us to do in partnership, as I say, with, with the Job Centre um, Plus team, what the, what the programmes allow us to do is to sit down with a client, uh, understand your recruitment needs. So what are the roles that you're trying to, to recruit into? Um, we can then take the job description from you and work with Jay, um, our colleagues in the Job Centre to advertise that, that job description. But at the same time, we will take that job description to develop the training program. So, for example, if you are recruiting into customer service roles, um, our team will sit with you to get an understanding of what's your customer service culture, um, how, um, how do you as a business like to deal with perhaps difficult customers. Um, and so some of the content of that program, perhaps around dealing with difficult customers, particularly at the moment, having empathy skills to be able to deliver, um, to be able to work with, with customers who are perhaps in challenging situations. Um, all of that content we will develop in partnership with you to make sure that, yes, it has that core training element, but that it's got your own business um, culture and process wrapped around it. Um, so that's just an example there on a, on a customer service uh, uh, program. Um, we can develop swaps across all sorts of industries and, and, and programs. Um, so the, the, the candidates, um, we will work with the job centre. Candidates will apply to come on the, the, to come on the programme. Um, they have a, an initial sort of, um, I suppose, sifting exercise at the beginning of the programme, um, just making sure that they've got either the right entry level, um, the right sort of, um, that they're wanting to join the programme for the, for the right reasons. Um, and then from that, they will come through the programme with, with us and with you as the employer. Um, at the end of that programme, um, they will go on to some sort of work experience element with you and say, we'll, we'll come back to that. And then interviewed and hopefully successful candidates will start with you. In terms of timeframes, a, a set based work programme can, can vary in terms of the timing, um, depending on how what, what you're looking for. Um, we currently are running one for, for a particular client that is around a three week period. Um, and that seems to work really well for that particular client. So it's two weeks of training, one week of um, work experience when really what they've done is moved part of their induction into the program. Um, and then they, they interview and um, it, with this particular client sort of start the candidates quite quickly the 
next day or next couple of days. The reason why I say I think that their, their, their magic um, uh, and the sort of hidden secret is that a, a recruitment program like this through a set based work academy model is at, is at no cost to you as an employer. Uh, it, it is fully funded either by West Midlands Combined Authority uh, or the Education and Skills Funding Agency. Um, and also the candidates who are coming through the program are still able to claim any of their job seekers allowance or, or support that they need whilst they're having that additional training to help them in essence, reskill and retrain to enter new careers. So if you could take me on to the, to the next slide, please. There we go. So when we're looking there for what really, you know, one of the benefits of a, of a swap, uh, a swap style recruitment to your business, just really three things I wanted to, to pull out. I mean, I'm more than happy to talk to you for, for a long time over a cup of coffee about what the, 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 the benefits to your business might be. But uh, just the, sort of the three key highlights for me are enabling you to really recruit staff with the right training and skills uh, and therefore sort of improving the, the return on investment of, the, of time that, that you get with, a, with, with this type of model. So because you're allowed and able to influence that training element so much, um, you know that by the time those individuals have come through that, in essence, training and recruitment program, that they have got that level of skill that you are, you are looking for, that base level of skill to, to come into your, into your business. Um, as, a, as I say, sort of, it has got that similarity of taking an induction program um, and putting it into your recruitment program. Um, what we've also experienced is um, firms feeding back to us that it's, it's reducing their recruitment risk. Um, so we've got employee, as you can see, you've got candidates coming through the program who have, will develop experience of your business and you will de develop experience of them. So quite easily through that program, as you can see, people, both you, yourselves and the candidates are able to make decisions about actually is this the type of business, the values and the culture that, that I think I can join and I think I can be successful in? And the other way around for you as a business to be able to be assured that people who are coming through the program and then joining your firm have experienced your business uh, and, and therefore their, their longevity um, is, is going to increase. They're, they're not coming into you sort of cold as a new employee on, on day one. Um, and what we also find in terms of sort of the, the return on investment, as I say, that, that time investment, um, is that it enables staff to be inducted into the business very quickly. Um, so what we know from, from particularly the firm that, that, that my colleague Luke's going to do a, a quick case study on, um, is that because um, candidates have been through this three week programme, um, when they join the firm to start, you know, if they're successful and they join the firm to start in paid employment on, on day one, um, they're able to, in essence, hit the ground running quite quickly um, because they've had a lot of that induction or a lot of that um, exposure to the firm um, through that, um, that set to base work academy programme. So therefore, of course, productivity levels start to start to rise. So for me, they are a real key driver in how you can um, enhance your recruitment. Um, we work with firms who use a swap model with us or with other providers as, as part of their, of, of their recruitment and, and really help to sort of drive recruitment and decrease some of their recruitment costs when, when needed, when for, for suitable roles. So at that point, if it's okay, I'd like to um, hand over to the next slide and bring in my colleague, Luke, um, who's going to do a quick sort of five minute overview because conscious of time on one of our clients and just to give you a flavor for what model that we've, we've got with that with that client. Luke, could I bring you in, please? Of course, good, good morning, everyone. Um, as, as Susie's already given you some of, some of the details, I'm, I'm gonna to talk to you about how, how, this, how this sort of looks in practice uh, when we're dealing with a, a working and thriving sector-based work academy program that's already set up. Um, and as Jeremy sort of touched upon a while ago regarding apprenticeships, they are, they are in vogue at the minute, they are a, a flavor of the month. Um, and and lots of people are looking to set up sector-based work academies and they're significantly championed by the Job Centre Plus in Birmingham and Solihull. Um, so in, in January 2016, I'll, I'll talk about our, our partnership first. Um, we began working with a client uh, in the energy sector uh, on, on a sector-based work academy programme who were facing significant issues at recruitment stage. They were experiencing high attrition, uh, high attrition slash churn rate, um, and it was quite a demanding job. Uh, so they were finding that 
Um, there was a significant lack of skill set for the people that they were able to bring in. Um, so we sat down with this, with this particular client, um, along with the, the Job Centre Plus uh, at district level, uh, to propose a swap to, to aid their recruitment, which would be then supported at every stage by the JCP and the council. Um, and the aim being to provide a, a dedicated and bespoke uh, training programme to the client's needs uh, with a guarantee of work experience and a job interview for appropriate candidates. And, and that's very true what Susie's just said. Um, the employer bought into this at an early stage. So that was very beneficial to us because that then allows us to really utilise the swap and really champion it as, as, a, as a recruitment driver. Um, and due to the nature of their ever expanding business, uh, we've operated this swap ever since. And before the pandemic, this was something we could offer every two weeks to up to 15 Job Centre Plus candidates. Um, so there was a real high turnover of, of, of candidates that we were able to put through the programme. And because the, 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 the client were constantly recruiting, they were able to recruit on a regular basis as well. So the swap is a traditionally is traditionally a three week program split into uh, two weeks of pre-employment training, one week's worth of work experience, and then a, a guaranteed job interview at the end. The beauty, as Susie has also touched touched upon, uh, is that the employer leads the conversation in terms of how training is shaped. So the course is designed to develop a specific skill set for a specific job role within your business, and as a result, you end up with something that's totally bespoke and unique. Um, Successful candidates then progress on to work experience for further training, um, and that allows them to gain a greater insight into company ethos, um, on the job training, some situational training, um, as this particular client is very customer service focused. Um, th th they'll do training, situational training that's relevant to the job that they'll be expected to, to, to do. Um, and at the end of that work experience, um, all successful candidates are offered a job interview. Um, and all of this is completed within three week, a three week period. So from the start, from the, from the, from the recruitment of the learner onto the program at the start of the course to the, to the job interview at the end, that all takes place within three weeks. So that's what, that's what our current swap looks like with this particular client. Um, but since, since COVID, um, the, the, the job has, 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 has developed a more digital focus. Can, uh, the, the, the employers uh, are, now, are now asking their employees to work from home. And as a result of that, we've been able to mold the programme, we've changed the programme, um, and we now have a much more digital focus. So this, 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 this course or this swap um, that would have previously been delivered in the classroom is now delivered online. So we, we've been innovative and, and we've tried to be creative in delivering the swap um, to allow to allow for this change and, and to allow for this increased digital focus. Um, the benefits of the swap, um, I mean, the, 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 there's an abundance, um, but the JCP supporting the promotion of candidates uh, and, and there's no cost to the employer. So effectively, it's free recruitment with dedicated job specific training, which is funded by the West Midlands Combined Authority. Um, I'd also like to rebuke the stigma at this point, and I'm aware there's, there, there is there is a, a lady from the DWP in here today. Um, I'd like to rebuke the stigma uh, surrounding JCP candidates. Um, as a result of the pandemic, there is now an obscenely swollen, highly skilled, unemployed population in Birmingham. And my personal experience is dealing with job with job centres in Birmingham um, and Solihull. Um, we're, see, we're seeing that these people are, are now out of, out of work. People who have previously worked in hospitality and retail, for example. Um, people who, who have worked in, in, in a specific job for a very long period of time that, that may have not done training for years, now, now find themselves out of work. And they're looking to enter new industries where, 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 where jobs are more sustainable and their em employment opportunities are more plentiful, given, given, given the nature of the pandemic and how it has certainly wrecked certain industries within, within the Midlands. Um, I'm part of a dedicated job skills team that will help sift these candidates when they apply um, to ensure high quality, high, high caliber, sorry, and high quality candidates um, end up on these courses that, that that will have the relevant skill set, and we are able to mould so that so that by the time they've progressed through the through through the, through the swap, they're in a position to to then really add a, a useful benefit to your business, um, and 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 as well, just to touch upon something I mentioned earlier. This training can be tailored and molded in flux. So if the job role changes whilst 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 we're offering the sector based work academy program, um, so can the training. And, and we work very closely with the employer in ensuring that this this conversation happens on a regular basis. We've been offering this particular swap for five years and the training has changed frequently throughout that. The job looks very different uh, now to what it did in January 2016 when we started offering it. And therefore, the training looks different as well. Uh, so that's that's a very important thing to, to, to be saying as well. Um, the key point here, everyone wins, in my opinion. Um, candidates gain access to, to free training and work experience. Um, and even if they don't get a job at the end of the programme, they secure valuable skills that are transferable when applying for other jobs. 
The college then solidifies its relationships with local employers and the job centre within the, within the local district uh, by delivering high quality bespoke training for an employer's needs. Um, and the employer uh, secures a monetarily free, risk-free, which, which is something Susie's also touched upon, risk-free approach uh, when hiring new staff with the right skills for the right job, um, as well as providing jobs for local Birmingham residents, which is also, it's also a way of giving back to the local unemployed population in Birmingham, um, which in turn helps stimulate Birmingham's local economy, uh, which, is, which is also massively important here. Um, and, and lastly, I'm aware I'm, I'm pushed for time, but successes to date, since January 2016, over 600 candidates have successfully navigated the swap. Susie might back me up here, might be closer to 625 now. Um, and they've, they've, they've found work with the employer. A significant percentage have experienced upward mobility within the business. So they've gone on to become team leaders or, or, or gone into management positions uh, with, 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 the, with, the, with the employer, um, having come through the sector-based work academy programme. They've also told us the attrition rate is significantly better when comparing those um, that have completed the swap with direct hires. Um, and, and I think on a personal note, with regards to, to my team in particular, um, we have now accomplished a successful and seamless transi transition to digital delivery uh, as a result of the pandemic. So whilst this would have been classroom based, uh, we're now offering JCP candidates uh, the chance to do a full training course, work experience and gain a job interview all without leaving the house. Um, and given the job is now a work from home job as well, it's a good way of securing a job without actually ever having to leave your house. Uh, and and that's, that's, a, that's a massive bonus, I think, um, for, for job centre candidates at the moment. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's a whistle stop tour of <laughs> uh, a, a working and thriving sector based work academy. Thanks, Luke. And I think that's a really good case study awesome. for us to have just highlighted there. Um, so thank you. And Emily, I'll hand back over to, to you because I'm conscious of our time. No problem at all. I was just going to flag up the question that we had earlier on in the chat. Vocational training is very relevant, as we touched upon, particularly with the plan for jobs and the government. To really grow this, how can parents and carers also be informed more about the options to support their children with their career choices? So um, I'm sort of happy to, to, to take that one. Um, it's, it's always the biggest challenge actually is, is how to, um, how to be able to communicate, um, a lot of this to, to parents and to, to teachers in, in schools. Um, we look to, to obviously national government with some of the national campaigns and we, we know that, that, that those will start to, to increase in terms of awareness campaigns. Um, we as, as BMET though, so sort of in the circular area that, that I suppose we can control, we as BMET have uh, two routes that we try to use for, 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 for informing um, parents, carers and teachers. Um, so the one route is we have a dedicated schools team. So our schools team go out into schools um, and will run workshops. Um, so they'll in particular run a workshop, for example, on apprenticeships um, to both school children, but also to um, staff, and in some cases, um, we get asked to run those to, to, to parents of, of school children. So we've got a dedicated schools team who, who provide that service on our behalf, and I suppose on the, on the West Midlands behalf. Um, we as a, as a college, particularly uh, this year, um, um, have been running quite a significant amount of open days and open evenings. Again, uh, we've had to do all of that, that virtually. Um, that's allowed us to look at different models. Um, and recently, Two weeks ago, I, I, I think, um, if somebody gives me a nod, but around about two weeks ago, we ran a, a, an open evening that was just for parents. So we, we, you know, we're conscious that there is so much change going on in education at the moment, that the more we can have that sort of um, parent-led conversation as well, um, the more we can help, you know, coming back to the beginning bit of this, this, this session, the more we can help to try and perhaps demystify and clarify what's what different routes and different options um, look like. So we are looking forward to seeing some perhaps more national led campaigns, but uh, on, on a regional basis. And you know, if, if people here are who have joined us today are, are wanting as, as a parent or as a carer to, to talk through additional options, my email is, is, is in the chat box. Feel free to contact me um, and I will always be able to, to set up a conversation either with our team or with some of our curriculum team to help you navigate some of those, those options at the moment if you've got children or, or 
people that you're looking after who you might need some support on. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you, Susie. I'll, um, I'm conscious of time and wrapping up. So there's a final slide about support that BMEC can offer. Um, and we'll send um, we'll send some information around after the event. Um, so that, and of course, as always, um, Susie's information is in the chat. Um, and you're more than welcome to reach out via us at the chamber as well, if that's helpful. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to all of you who've spoken today, all of those who have been uh, watching and virtually attending, um, and of course to BMET and the University of Birmingham's Work Inclusivity Research Centre and Aston University as our headline sponsors of Growth Group People. A small short plug for our upcoming events, do check them out on the Chamber website, um, and also of course our Growth People Conference on the 30th of March, which will feature uh, BMET's upcoming, uh, incoming, uh, uh, principal is the word I'm looking for. Uh, and if you can spare five minutes to complete our survey, it'd be hugely appreciated. But thank you again, and I hope this was a useful, useful session. And I look forward to hearing those, hearing from those who reach out. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Enjoy your day. <laughs>